All right, we are live. How's everybody doing today? Who's out there? Put it in the chat. It's kind of crazy today. Um, you know, put where you're from, where you're watching this, and then also what the temperature is. Um, I'm in South Carolina, and we got like 20 degrees temperatures last night. And I know that's probably like way warm for most of the country, but for us, it's not. <laughs> so I had heat go out, pipes freeze, all that good stuff. So how are we doing out there? All right, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, thank you all, first of all, for coming to the live stream. The last one we had, it was kind of impromptu just to kind of test the tech and it worked out great. There's a bunch of people there and it was awesome. So I really appreciate y'all showing up and supporting the channel and asking your questions. Um, I have a couple of questions from people who are on the newsletter list. If you are not on the newsletter list and you want to be, go ahead and go to butcherwizard dot com scroll down it'll say join the mailing list and then we have discounts that go out for different products we have we have question and answers we have extra information for when videos come out so again if if you're interested in that go ahead and go to the website and check that out all right georgia 12 degrees this morning thank you <laughs> you got me beat it was only like 20 but you know hey I don't even know what people in the Northeast do or in, in northern part of the United States, um, different parts of the world. I have no idea what y'all do. I'm like a warm weather person and I can't go any more further north, I don't think so. All right, let's just jump right into some of the questions that I got from um, the newsletter list. For the people who are in the chat, go ahead and put a question in the chat. If you would put the word question first. And then that will help me differentiate through all the chatter of the of the um, chat. So um, let's see. Uh, Scott had a good question. Um, what are the grades of beef and how do I know which ones are the best? All right. So the grades of beef go as follows. So prime is your best cut. That's their best kind of beef. Um, it goes choice and then it goes select. There's other cuts below that, but those are more like or those other grades below that, but that's kind of like a, um, you know, there's cutter and canner and all these other cool names that don't sound like anything that you want to buy. You're not going to buy those in the grocery store. The lowest grade you'll find is select in some grocery stores, but most places have choice and prime. Um, funny thing about grading, um, grading is a voluntary process. So done by the ranchers to sell their beef at a higher price. So um, it's not inspected. So all meat is inspected by the USDA. And then there's an optional grading process for the ranchers that go through that process. So prime is going to be your best. It's going to have your most intramuscular fat. It's going to have uh, a good lean to fat ratio. So and that's the best and most expensive. Choice, again, is what's mainly available. That's what's most widely available. And that's what you're going to find. 90% of the time in the grocery store is choice. All right. Um, Randall had a good question about um, making beef tallow. So I have a video on beef tallow and I made it using the scraps from my different projects, steak cutting projects. So the scraps from the ribeyes, scraps from the strips, taking that hard fat and then rendering it down into beef tallow. Now, that is not the best way to do beef tallow. If like the best kind of fat is that suet. That is a, that is there there's fat around some of the internal organs of the cow and that is the one that's going to give you the purest fat. Um I have wanted to show you all how to take just fat you're going to take off of the ribeye, off of the strip, things like that and and do something with that fat. So it works out just fine. You can still cook with it. It's great. It's just um, when you buy beef tallow, you, a lot of times it's done with the suet, which is from the, around the internal organs. But you can still use that. As long as it's a hard fat, you can still use it and make beef tallow with it. So go check out that video. It was one of my earlier videos. So it's a, it could be a little rough, but you know, I got, I got a little better over the years. So let's see what else we got.
Oh, someone put in a, um, a link for a chamber vacuum sealer. You know, again, those chamber vacuum sealers are like, are going to help you out a lot. They're going to go really quickly. They're going to hold that seal. But again, they're big, they're bulky, they're expensive. So again, it's just all what you want to do. But um, if you're going to do like a whole, like if you're going to do a whole project where you're like, I'm going to get a strip, I'm going to get a ribeye, I'm going to get some tenderloins and do all in one day, you might want to um, and ground and make your own ground, ground meat. You might want to invest in one of those chamber vacuum sealers. It might help you out. Um, I don't have one, so I don't really recommend, I don't have one to recommend, but again, there was one in the chat there. So check that out. Again, guys, I wanted to talk about just why you should be doing some of these projects. And like, I know I get a lot of comments and the YouTube comments, you know how those go, but like of people like, why would you waste your time? Why would you do this? You know, we're here to kind of teach, I'm here to teach you how to save money and also have that fulfilling project that you you, you went from start to finish. You know, I, I would tell people like, well, do you wash your own car? Do you mow your own lawn? You know, why would you do that when you can pay someone else to do it? Well, the reason is, is you get that satisfaction of doing it yourself. You learn about where your meat comes from. And I think it's insanely interesting to find out different cuts, um, new cuts that I don't know about or how to cook different things. So again, I'm here to kind of show you all how you can, the normal person can go to the grocery store, go to Sam's, go to Costco, find a large cut of meat and have the confidence to break it down yourself and get better quality and save some money. So that's a lot of what I have like a lot of what I'm here to do. Yeah, great question. So um, feature video idea. I always love those. If you always drop me a line, you know, through email or Instagram or whatever um, about future video ideas about going through the grocery store and picking out different cuts and telling you what to do with them. That is a great idea. Um, I know I have um, sometimes I don't like acknowledge all the beginners, the super beginners that we have and the people who just want to be able to go to the grocery store and say, all right, I'm making a pot roast. Okay. I need a chuck roast. I need this. I need that. Like, what can I find and what can I do with it? So great video idea. I'm going to put that in the list. Yeah. Don't have, um, someone asked about cutting boards. I don't currently have any plans to, to make a cutting board. I, um, there's just ones that I've kind of gathered the ones in the videos, there's ones I've gathered for over the years. Again, when you're doing these things, the biggest thing about the cutting board is making sure it's big enough. Um, you gotta have a big enough cutting board. So if you're doing that whole ribeye, that whole tenderloin, that it all will fit on the cutting board. So I know some people have talked about like the kind of material, whether wood or plastic or whatever. I mean, as long as you're washing it, soap and water at the end, you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. I know people get kind of freaked out about like um, cutting boards, knife cuts or knife grooves in wooden cutting boards. I mean, you go to a butcher shop, it's it's called a butcher block for a reason. OK, it's made out of wood and that's it, it doesn't really matter the kind of surface that you're cutting on, just as long as it's big enough to protect your counters and to do the whole project. I just finished filming a video today that's going to come out um, in two weeks about how to make your own deli style roast beef. So that was kind of cool. I went to, uh, I got some stuff there from the grocery store. I got some um, roast beef from Whole Foods. So they roast their own there and then compared it to my, to my own, which I did from scratch. Um, it didn't take that much, that long. And it definitely you just kind of really season it, throw in the oven and that's it. Um, and then slice it. So that video is coming out in like i said two weeks so or a week from friday so this friday we won't have a, vid a new video but uh, that's why i want to do this live stream so we could kind of answer any questions you might have how do you someone asked how you clean the cutting board again i just do soap and water and and I don't get kind of, I don't get real crazy about it. We're not, you know, the normal person is not using it so much that it's going to be a food safety problem. I mean, just keep it, keep everything nice and clean. 
Soap and water, you're good to go. Oh, this is a good question. Would you say cutting specific portions of meat yourself is more cost effective than buying a quarter of a cow, a half a cow, or someone else cuts it? So there, I'll put that there. That's a very good question. All right. I know I'm playing with all this tech. I got a new program. I can throw things on the bottom. That's cool. Anyway, so here's how I feel about quarter cows, half cows, all that stuff. Um, it's the, That is the most cost effective way to get your, to go through a farmer, go through a processor, and that's where you're going to get the cheapest price per pound because you're going to get a ton of ground beef. You're going to get, um, you might not get as many steak cuts. You might not get all the cuts that you really, really want. Um, I do want to go through that process in a future kind of vid video series of going through that process for the people who really want to, to do that quarter and a half cows. Um, like I said, that's the cheapest way to do it. Then the most control that you can have, because you may not want to have um, all this ground beef. You may just want the steaks. So you can go and cut your own by buying the whole uh, subprimal cuts and getting exactly what you want. So you're when you get a quarter cow, you get a half cow, you're going to get what kind of they give you. You can give them um, specifications at the processor about how thick you want their six cut and different things. It's just going to depend processor to processor too about the, the, um, the amount of customization that you can do. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. I am not against getting a quarter half cow. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, it supports local ranchers, support, supports local businesses for processing. So uh, again, I am not, I, I am trying to show people also how you can just go to a regular grocery store and do these projects. So I don't know. All right, there we go. Yeah, someone's talked about the Bearded Butchers uh, is a great, great channel. They break down the whole thing. I mean, they are custom processors. So it's it's a very cool channel to watch about where um, all these cuts come from. And you can really see in the whole thing in real time. So I love that channel. All right, uh, is butchered beef aged for 10 days in a, in a fridge or freezer? So anyway, when you're buying things that are in that cryovac, that vacuum seal pack, and there's that myoglobin in there, it's not blood, it's just a combination of water and proteins and things like that. Um, it is wet, it's what's called wet aging. So they put it in there um, and it can last for a long time in that cryovac package. So it has aged, but it's wet aged as it's shipping across the country. So it has been um, that wet age, the difference between wet aging and dry aging. So the dry aging is where you take that meat, you take it out of the package, you put it in a controlled humidity environment for a distinct period of time. It loses a little bit of water, concentrates the flavors. It also gives that kind of umami kind of like um, savory, more savory flavor. So if you see dry age steaks, those have the wet age steaks that have been taken to another process to dry age them. What are some other channels that you guys like to watch as far as in the cooking or meat space? Go ahead and put those in the comments. I'd love to hear some new channel. I'm always looking for new channels to kind of get ideas from or just, just support. Um, it's always really important, especially in this kind of community of YouTube, where we can support other channels that are coming up that are trying to do different things. So if you have some different channels you like, go ahead and throw those in. We'll, we'll shout them out and you guys can check those out. I wanted to, um, for the people who are on here, we got like 43 people on here. Awesome. So thank you guys so much for coming out. I know it's noon, so it's a little weird, but um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the new knives we just do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about the new knives that we just rolled out. So this is the Butcher Wizard 
10 inch breaking knife. You've seen me use a breaking knife um, on to make ribeye to cut ribeyes and strips and things like that. The chuck rolls, all that stuff. So we we went and I manufactured, I got this manufactured, put our logo on it. It's a really solid knife. And the best part is it's under $50. So I wanted to make a knife that got the job done and was not exorbitantly expensive because you're not going to use it every day. Um, I think if you're going to spend a bunch of money on a knife, I would go using uh, the highest amount for a chef's knife or something you're going to use every day. But the two, the the breaking knife again is very specialized. So it's a it's a great knife, very solid, you know, sharp. Everything everything about it's great. And it, I wanted to keep it cheap so that you every, a lot of people could get them, and it doesn't have for a knife you're not going to use all the time. I didn't want to spend a ton of money. Um, so that's the 10 inch breaking knife. We also have a six inch boning knife. I use this one a lot more than the breaking knife, but um, there's that one. Um, and for the people who are here, I really appreciate it. Or if you're watching on the replay again, appreciate that so much things going on with that. I'm going to put a link here in the, in the chat and then in the description for the replay, I'll put it in there about a 10% off discount you can get. Um, at butcherwizardshop.com. Let me put that in there just so I don't forget. Boom, there we go. So it went out to everybody. So go ahead and you can pick up your knives. I mean, I, I again, I cannot say enough things about so much support that this channel has got over the, you know, it's only been a little more than a year since I started the channel. So um, I just can't thank you all enough for watching the videos and doing all the things Um you know, supporting the sponsors, supporting the affiliates, like the products that I recommend. I really appreciate it. So thank you so much. All right, who we got? We got Guga Foods. Love Guga. He's the, that's, that's kind of the most, obviously the most popular in the meat steak, uh, the meat slash steak space is great. Cowboy Kent Rollins. Awesome. Um, I think he's from Oklahoma. I'm actually from Oklahoma originally, Oklahoma City. Um, Cosmos barbecue is another one who's, uh, from Oklahoma that I, I, you know, didn't, didn't know at the time, but, uh, meat church. Oh yeah. Meat church is great. Um, all the barbecue channels are awesome. I mean, people really are making, um, um, there's a, so much information about barbecue. It's, it's awesome. So. Let's see. Do, do, do. Uh, keeping knife sharp. Have you ever tried the tumbler sharpener? Yes, I have. I have a couple of videos on the tumbler sharpener, the the rolling sharpener. I really like that. Um, it simplifies the sharpening um, task because it can get pretty. Um, if you have a whetstone, it can get a little tedious of like, okay, what angle do I need? Uh, you know, do I need a twenty degree? What is twenty degrees? Um, for people who don't know, the tumbler sharpener is basically. I don't have one handy, but it's over there. But um, it's a block that's magnetic, and then it puts your knife on that block, and it's and it magnetizes to it, and keeps that at that twenty degree angle. And then it has a rolling part of a diamond sharpener that sharpens each side, and it, it's it's really handy. I mean, it's a little expensive, but I mean, it's really handy to always get that good, nice um, sharpened edge. Um, you can use a whetstone, no problem. Um, I So when you're using your knives, any, any one of your knives, you hit it with a sharpening, a honing steel, which is that long kind of cylindrical piece of metal that um, that comes in every set. Um, you want to hone, that's you hone your knife every time you pull it out of the block. Um, you sharpen your knife about every couple of months, depending on use. And then once it starts getting dull, hit it with the sharpener, Hit it with the steel every time, and that's going to how you keep it nice and sharp. Oh, Jeff, I can't wait to get my knives. Weather has delayed delivery. Yep, I am learning so much about how shipping works and how manufacturing works. Uh, I kind of had this crazy idea of I would create this, manufacture this knife, and then I'm kind of learning on the fly for all the rest of the intricacies of um, e-commerce. So it's been uh, uh, oof, a lot of things learned on the fly. So that's how I learn stuff, though. 
Picanha, in my opinion, is the best value stake. Love Picanhas, um, the Sirling cap. Uh, when, once it gets a little warmer and I can go back outside, I do plan to do some Picanha videos. I got all of the, the uh, skewers to do them kind of Brazilian style. Really excited to give those a whirl. Um, but again, it is too cold out there right now. Big ice storm out here in Oregon. I know this is crazy. This is so much cold weather. Um, the tumbler and Horl's another one, uh, another kind of does the exact same thing. Uh, seem like they would only work on wide blade knives like chef's knives. Okay. So you can use any kind of knife. You just have to prop up the knife on either like a small cutting board or something like that. But if you can prop up that knife a little bit on a solid surface, it on a solid surface, it will go ahead and get that contact that you need. So you can still you can still do it. But again, learning how to do it on a whetstone is great too. I mean, you just got to get out there and do it and don't be scared you're going to mess something up. You can always fix stuff. Where is the Delmonico on the cow? So the Delmonico is a um is the chuck eye basically. Um so as the rib eye goes into the chuck there is a little bit of crossover in between the ribeye and the chuck. So there's a little bit of ribeye stuck in the chuck and you can buy, and that's where I've done where you do chuck eyes. Chuck eye steak is that, that it's the same as a ribeye, but it is in the chuck and sold at chuck like prices. So it's a cool hack to kind of get a ribeye for cheaper. But El Delmonico is that, is that chuck eye cut. It's just another name for it. On the knives, more questions about the knives. Um, when you're taking care of them, don't put any of your knives, your stainless steel knives, or your high carbon steel knives, any of those. Never, ever, ever put them in the dishwasher. Just get soap and water, good to go. You know, be careful because you got the ed, you know the knife's edge, but don't put them in the dishwasher. Please don't. Don't do it. Kind of a funny story on sharpening knives. If uh, if you all seen that that initial that first ribeye video that I did that really did well on YouTube, everyone seemed to enjoy it. Um, I made a joke about um, that the knives that I was recommending at the time were so cheap that you could just throw them away instead of sharpening them. And then I got thousands thousands of comments. Wait a second, you know how to sharpen knives? Are you crazy? Yes, I know how to sharpen a knife. But it was just so crazy. I made, it was my attempt at a joke in the video. And of course, that's the one that blows up and does, and everyone has a problem with it. But, you know, whatever. What else we got? What else we got? Some of my favorite cuts... Uh, my favorite budget cuts. This was a question that I got the other day. My favorite budget cuts. I love, love, love a Denver steak. Um, I kind of, I love a good ribeye, but and, and but but there's something about a leaner cut that I really enjoy. And um, that Denver steak is it. Now it is in the chuck, so it's a little cheaper, but it's really hard to find. So you got really got to look. If you see a Denver steak, go ahead and pick one up. Try it. Don't cook it over medium well. You know, it's going to be, Tough, tougher because it comes out of the chuck, but it's a cool cut that if you've never heard of it, you should give it a try as a good budget alternative to some of the other um, some of the other steak cuts that we've done. It's kind of like a New York strip a taste to it, feel to it. So check that one out. Chuck eyes are great. That's like your ribeye. That's your poor man's ribeye. You know, your, your cheap ribeye. The reason you can't find those things a lot is because what'll have that ch whole chuck roll is what it's called that where the Denver steak, the chuck eye steak is a lot. And the chuck roast, a lot of times grocery stores take that whole chuck roll and they just slice chuck roast out of it because they're more popular. Um, people know what a chuck roast is. If they put Denver steak on the label, you may not know what a Denver steak is. So, you know, um, yeah, but Denver steak, chuck eyes. Um, the Terrace Major, I know this is like the really hard one to find. 
Um, I found it at the chef store. You can get a big bag of them, but it's like, they're like little beef tenderloins and it's in the chuck. And I, you know, I got, it's not exactly like a beef tenderloin, but it's like, a, it's $7 a pound uh, at my chef store, like seven fifty a pound. So um, they kind of look like little tenderloins. You know, again, all these budget cuts, you don't want to cook medium well. They're going to get, they're going to dry out a little more, a uh, little propensity to dry out and be tough. But if you like that medium and those, those terrace majors are really good and really versatile. So if you can find one, you should try it, but it comes out of a different section of the chuck. Um, but it, it's a good one too. Is the London Royal cut from the shoulder clod? Okay. No. Um, did we, so the shoulder clod comes out of the chuck. The London broil comes out of the round. So that's on the back end of the cow. Um, it is the inside round, um, top round. The London broil kind of gets shifted around to a, a bunch of kind of marketing. But um, your London broil is on the other side, the back end of the cow. So it's a little, it's, they're different. Um, I hate removing silver skin. Oh, everyone hates removing silver skin. That is not, that is no fun. It's a very tedious job. Um, once you do it a couple of times, it gets a little bit easier, but it is not a fun job, but you can't skip it because you got that chewy, that, that, so what silver skin is, is a, it's called, a, it's elastin. So elastin is a, is a um, connective tissue um, that will never, ever break down. It will just become like a rubber band on that steak. It's found on the tenderloin as most, you know, it, if you have had that, if you've had a filet mignon steak and you've had that really chewy piece that you cannot possibly chew or swallow, that is probably because they did not remove the silver skin. So there's nothing really you can do with it. It doesn't have any flavor. It doesn't break down into gelatin like some other connective tissues do. It is just... I mean, it should be a you know, waste product, but again, you got to get that bony knife. You got to get underneath it and really cut, slide out, slide out your knife and cut out that silver skin. But a good way to practice is pork tenderloins because they have silver skin on them too. And they're much cheaper than filet mignon. So. Have I done a video on what to do with the tenderloin tail? No, I haven't, but uh, uh, great things to do with the tenderloin tail. I mean, you can do, you can cut it up and saute it into different um, sauteed beef preparations. I know everyone says stir fry or whatever. Um, you can marinate them and it's the same meat quality as the tenderloin. So it's not, the quality of the meat's not different. There's just the size and the shape that's different. I have to let my dog out. I am so sorry. I'll be, I'll, one second. And I just hit my knee on the table. All right. Um, tenderloin tails. It's just really the shape that you have to deal with, um, not the quality of the meat. So you can slice it up. You can cut it up. Uh, when I was in a million years ago, when I worked in this fine dining steakhouse, we would take the tails, we would marinate them, and then um, like put it, saute them on a flat top or on a saute pan to get them nice and you know, caramelize all the way around and then just make little medallions out of them. So, I mean, you can do stuff like that. If you, you know, there's all kinds of stuff you can do. Do you really use the made in pans and how do you properly season them? Yes, I do use the made in pans. Um, I use them way before they were, they sponsored like one or two videos. But before then, I had a whole set of made-in pans. I really like them. Um, they have several different um, different materials that they use. Um, high carbon steel, stainless steel, and the anodized, which is that non-stick surface. I have a couple of each one. Um, the only ones you really have to worry about keeping seasoned are those high carbon steel ones. And you're just, just like a cast iron skillet. You're going to like take a little bit of like vegetable oil at the end after you've washed it and dried it and just take a little bit of vegetable oil in the inside and um, 
do it that way. I do like the, um, they have a, like a little flat top thing. That's high carbon steel that goes on top of the burners of the, of your stove, which I really, I really like that one. That's probably the one I use the most. Um, it's a lot of grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> I got four kids, so it's a lot of things like that, but, uh, it's cool. Best options for fajitas. Great question. All right. I love some fajitas. I love some Mexican food. So um, flank steak are great. Skirt steak is great. Um, you don't have, you don't really have to, you just slice it and you can saute it with the rest of your seasonings. Um, just depends on what you're looking for for fajitas. Um, but those are the, probably the two that I would use the most. Skirt steak and flank steak. When you use a honing steel, do you go down or up with the blade? Okay, so let me go grab one. I'll be right back. So, since I'm actually in my kitchen, we'll just do a little class. Let me see if I can do this with the... All right, so this is a honing steel. Again, you, if you got a set, when you got like married, you got married or you got a new house, this is a honing steel. So what you're going to do is hold it like this and then, oh, here, if I go backwards now or down. So you're going to take your knife in your, this hand, in your right hand, and then make that, try to make that 20 degree angle. It's a, it's a very shallow angle. Um, and then you're going to come down and I always say like, move your elbow up. Come down like that. And then you go down the other side of the blade. So I'm really going in front. I'm going in front and I'm going in the back. So. And you just nice, nice and easy. Slow down. Whenever you're using a knife, you don't have to be like a crazy chef person and do it really fast, but just do it nice and slow. And you're putting a little bit of pressure on it. And that's what's going to give it that uh, help that edge. Um, it's not sharpening it as much as it's honing the steel and getting it back to the edge. If you don't do it a lot and you got a dull knife, you got to go to the whetstone and start or the tumbler or some other sharpening system and you know get the edge back. But that honing steel is very easy to just do as soon as you pull it out of your knife block, as soon as you pull it out of your drawer, hit it with that honing steel. That's the best way to do it. All right, no, new to grinding besides uh, chuck and brisket, any other pieces that are good for hammer? Uh, yes, so I love so love doing the chuck. Um, you can do the brisket um, or the brisket trimmings. A lot of times, what I'll do the, for grinding is when you get when you've already taken the plunge and you have that grinder, then it's like okay, now the world is your oyster as far as grinding goes. So when you're doing any kind of project, I will. When I'm taking the trim off there, I will put it in a bag and mix it all up. So it, there's some ribeye in there. There's some strip in there, tenderloin, all the stuff. Brisket fat, brisket trimmings, all that stuff can go into a kind of a bag. And I throw it into my freezer. And when I get um, enough of it, I'll pull them all of the freezer, thaw them out, and get it through the grinder. So usually my ground beef is a combination of everything that I've worked on since then. But like... Um, sirloin a sirloin is good if you can get a sirloin knuckle at Costco. My Costco has those. Um, that kind of gives out the lean. The trick is if you have getting that fat to lean ratio down. Um, that's the trickiest part. And the way to do that by eye is just to go to the grocery store. And when you're next time you're at the grocery store, go look at what the 75 25 ground beef looks like. What does the 80 20 look like? What is the 96 four look like. And then you can tell how red it is and what the kind of what the color is. It just, that's how you want to really kind of base your fat to lean ratios. But that's the biggest part. But again, just use the scraps. That's the best. That's how you get the most money savings is use those scraps.
Oh, thank you, Jay Housen, for the uh, super sticker. I appreciate it. That's awesome. Thank you. Thank you for the donation. I appreciate that. All right. What else do we want to know about? It's cold weather braising. That is the cooking technique that I use the most when it starts to get cold outside. So braising, take the meat. Basically, what you're going to do is sear it in a hot pan, pull out the meat, add your aromatics, onions, celery, carrots, things like that. Add some flavorings. You know, if you want to do red wine, if you reduce your red wine, you want to add beef stock, add your chunks of beef back in, just let it simmer and do its thing till it pulls apart. Use the chuck roast, any kind of tough cut of meat. So anything out of the round, anything out of the chuck, um, those are the best for braising. And those are just some of my favorite meals. I don't know, short ribs, stuff like that. I, I just love a good braise. If I had to pick one cooking technique, it would probably be the braising. Okay, so this is a good question. Um, I know we have probably some carnivore people or some uh, um, keto dieters, all that stuff, ain't like um, about putting organ meats in your ground beef. Awesome. You know, all you have to do is mix it around. What I would do, this is when I do the grind, what I'll do is I'll put, I'll take all my meat and put, cut it into chunks that fit in my grinder, depending on your grinder. Um, whether you have the one that hooks on like the KitchenAid mixer or whether you have a dedicated grinder, just as long as it's enough to fit down the chute. Um, what I will do is it'll take all that stuff that you have, uh, all that cubed meat, and then mix it up so that you have an even distribution. So I'll mix up the fat chunks, mix up the beef or the, the meat chunks. If you want to add um, liver to it, if you want to add organ meats, Chop those up and mix it all together before you put it in the grinder. And that way, everything is kind of equally distributed as much as possible. So when it goes through the grinder, it's still distributed. I'll do that with sausage. I'll season all my sausage. Um, uh, I'll season all the meat for the sausage before I put it in the grinder. And that way, it's already incorporated and dispersed in the grind. Oh, we got some people still smoking in the wintertime. Good for good for you. I I, I, I will too from time to time. Um, there's sometimes, man, I don't know, this cold's getting to me right now. I like, can't get warm today, but, you know, I, I'm not complaining. Again, it's South Carolina, so I'm not complaining. <laughs> Um, someone's saying about, about a knife selection or a budget knife selection. Um, or So the way I would do knives, I don't really like getting a whole set. I will get individual knives for what I need. And they last, because they last a long time. So you're going to have that knife for a while. I suggest the most money you spend is one that you're going to use the most. So a chef's knife, or um, this has always been a good one, this Santoku kind of style knife, easy for chopping. Um, whatever you're going to use the most of, spend the most amount of money of your budget on that. And the rest of them, you kind of, you need, um, let's see, you need a chef's knife, you need a paring knife, you know, big and small. So if you're going to, like, if you're going to do the butchery projects, breaking knife, bony knife, but those are extras. Those are kind of only if you're going to be doing this other stuff. Um, let's see, what other knives do I have? You know, a serrated knife for bread. Um, things like that. You don't really need that many knives to really be able to do all of the things that you need to do cooking wise. So, we had a bunch of people who are outside in the winter. Hey, you guys are, we're doing good.
Have I ever reverse seared a chuck stick? I haven't. Um, as a matter of fact, I've done, um, I've sous vide a chuck stick. And, but mainly if I get a chuck, if I get a, a, a chuck roast, I will braise it. I'm kind of a sucker for a good braise. So. All right, guys, I'm going to, we've been doing this for 40 minutes. So let's do a kind of a final call for some questions, maybe do one or two more, and then we'll get up, get on our way here. Go find some coffee. <laughs> All right, here's a good one. Is it better to use a double grind grinder or two passes through a single grind grinder? Okay, so. They are now, ha they now have like, um, I know meetyourmaker.com uh, meet is a good uh, site to get um, grinders. They have all kinds of them and they have one that, that does grind twice. I have not particularly used a grinder that grinds two times through one pass. Okay, you put the meat in, it goes through and it grinds twice. For ground beef, you're gonna need to grind, you're gonna need to go through two to three times depending on, um, the size of die you're using. So the die is like that little plate that has all the holes in it. Just how big it is. And you might, you're probably going to have to go at least two times, if not three times through this grinder. So if you have that double grind grinder, pass it through and it'll, it'll grind it up twice through one pass, saving you a little bit of time. Um, again, I have not, um, I haven't really tested them. So I can't really speak to them, but again, if it saves you a couple of times through, you know, if you're going to grind a bunch of different things, like if you're going to grind chicken, I, I usually only do chicken one way, one time through uh, pork for sausage. I'll do two times through because I like it a little more chunky, but ground beef, I'll do it three times through. All right. So somebody said they were grinding brisket. Um, and they put them into patties, put them on the grill, and then it didn't really hold together. You got to go through two or three times. Um, when you go to the grocery store, that ground beef has been through the grinder two or three times. And um, a lot of times they'll, grocery store trick, right? They'll say they're, they grind everything in house. Well, they take ground meat already and throw it through the grinder. So it'll go through one more time and they can say a ground, yeah, they got ground meat on house, in house. But, um, it takes longer than you think. If you go through that first time, you're going to get it real. It's going to be really, really chunky. It's 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 not going to be that ground beef texture that you're looking for two or three times. Uh, when is it okay to leave the silver skin on? So um, if you can't get it all, you just got to do your best. Um, there are different cuts that have different levels of silver skin. And it's harder to get to, easier to get to. Just do your best, get the most off that you can. And when we talk about silver skin, it's that elastin, that stretchy, silvery um, connective tissue. It's not like that, that thin sinewy fat. That is just fat that, that will render out. Um, what we're talking about silver skin is that if you take it off, you should be able to like stretch it and almost pop back like a rubber band. Uh, I just, uh, Justin, I just cut my first strip loin and beef rib eye about an hour ago. Oh, wow. Uh, thank you for introducing this to us. Yeah. Hey, it's been sitting there the whole time and you got to kind of like, um, just get a little bit of information and it's not, it's, it's pretty easy. It's pretty easy to do and it's fun. So, and you learn a lot about where your food comes from, which is also cool. Where's a good wood cutting board and where to buy it? Um, again, I you just got to kind of do some searches on Amazon. I like the Epicurean. Um, it's like a compressed. I'm, I don't even know if it's wood or it's all wood, but it's like really thin. I like those. Um, the one I use on my video is just a big butcher block cutting board that I had. And it looks cool on camera. And that's the reason I use that one. Um, and sometimes I'll put it in the shot and not even like, not even cut anything on it just so I can kind of line up where I am in the shot. So it's, you know, 
trying to make it look cool. But again, just look for, I, I don't, wouldn't overthink it. Um, just get one, get one of the good, a good size and go from there. Just bought a sous vide. Um, what recipes do you recommend to make in bulk? Um, you can do anything in that sous vide. It's really versatile. Um, I One of the videos I'm working on for next month is um, to sous vide a... All right. For those of you who are watching, you get a little, you know, <laughs> what's going on behind the scenes. I'm going to do a video about um, the eye of the round because it's known as like the worst cut of meat on the cow as far as it's kind of tougher. It doesn't have a lot of flavor. I'm going to show you a bunch of ways to cook it so it does have flavor. And um, <clears throat> one of the ways I like to do an eye of round is to put it in the sous vide like for 24 hours. And what that does is it breaks down a lot of the, uh, the, the fiber, the muscle fibers. And when you cut it, it is so tender. You can almost cut it with a fork. So that's a cool thing to do. But again, steaks are good in there. Um, if you're looking to do bulk stuff, you can put a whole chuck roast in there. As long as the tougher the cut of meat, the longer you're going to have to uh, put it in the sous vide. So again, just check out the recipes online. I mean, the sky is the limit with that thing because it just basically keeps that water temperature at a very specific temperature. And um, that's really all it does. So you can cook something to exactly that, that um, temperature. So it's, it's cool. I love mine. Um, Dan with the uh, ground beef, if you're making your own ground beef, um, Chuck, is great to as a great starter, um, adding all your beef trimmings. So usually I want to use I want to make ground beef when I have enough beef trimmings to make it all worth it. So th those are good, and you just want to work out that lean to fat ratio um, that you personally want because everyone's a little different on what they the kind of ground beef fat to lean ratio they want. So um, chuck brisket's great. Um, any one of those. Are, are really good. You can't go wrong. When you buy ground beef at the grocery store, it is the, a mix of all their trim. So it could be a whole host of different things. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead. It's been almost an hour. We're going to go ahead and sign off. Thank you all so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Um, definitely go check out the butcherwizard.com butcherwizardshop.com, all the things we got going on um, to get on that email list. And then you kind of be first to know about all the sales are run on the knives or when new videos come out. Uh, please check those out. Again, all the things. I really appreciate you all so much. 67 people. Amazing for noon on a Wednesday. Thank you all so much for being here. We will see you on the next one.